Okay, Ivan, I'm excited to start. start. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Dear colleagues, welcome to the second virtual meeting of the economic Today, we will consider our two subcommittee reports. I was hoping that we could meet in person, but I am delighted, nevertheless, that we can deliberate on our reports today. I would like to call the committee to order and declare the committee meeting open. I would also like to greet all members of the Economic and Security Committee. Please note that our aim remain to consider the final version of all our reports at the Athens annual session or, if necessary, in another round of online meetings. Some practical information. The two draft reports by our subcommittee, rapporteurs Jean-Marie Bocquel and Austrian Armonaita, that we will discuss today, as well as the draft agenda, can be found on the NATO Parliament Assembly website and on the SharePoint sent to your secretaries of delegations. Today is very tightly scheduled, and we will do our very best to keep this meeting under two hours. So we will have to exercise control on our debates to keep us on time. I will therefore structure the meeting of the following way. I will ask that first Senator Bokel to present his report. He will then collect all the comments, and he will respond to them all together afterwards. We will follow the same procedures for Ms. Armonaitis' report. I would like also appear to any members or delegations that have specific comments or suggestions to be sure to send this by email to Paul Cook, the committee director. If you have not already done so prior to the meeting. This will be very helpful when the report is redrafted for the second reading, hopefully at the fall session in Athens. Finally, I remind you today, please make sure you have a high quality headset with a quality microphone if you plan on speaking today. Our interpreters have great problems when speakers use poor equipment. I would now ask that the committee take up the agenda for this proceeding. Are there any comments? Are there any objections to the draft agenda? No? Seeing none. Thank you. It is adopted. I would like now like us to our reporter, Senator Bokel, to present the draft report on the Subcommittee on Transatlantic Economic Relations the Gulf crisis and global energy markets. I would like to note that this is Senator Bokel's last meeting with the NATO Parliamentary Assembly, as uh, he has decided not to stand for re-election in the French Senate. I would like, therefore, like to take this opportunity to thank you, Jean-Marie, for your outstanding service to this Assembly to our alliance and to your country. You have always been a pleasure to work with. Many of us will remember with great fondness the excellent visit to Paris and Toulouse you organized so that we could learn more about the French and European space industry. We will miss you in this committee. You have worked very hard effectively, and we have greatly enjoyed your effort as well as your cheerful company. On behalf of the entire committee and the NATO Parliament Assembly staff, therefore, I would like to wish you the very best as you start on this new phase of your life. We hope to see you very soon. Senator Bokel will speak in French. For those of us who do not understand French, please select the English channel on the bottom left of your screen. Senator Bokel, the floor is yours. You have the floor, sir. Thank you very much. 
I get the impression that perhaps uh, it is cut out. Can everybody hear me? We can hear you, but we can't see you anymore, sir. Back in, we have a brief moment of technical difficulty. We can wait a little bit. I'm sure he'll try and come right back into the meeting, sir. Maybe the internet don't have high speed. Definitely can be lots of different technical challenges. Okay. Paul, would you like to come back on, please? Do you, do you believe we should maybe look to the next report, or do you want to continue to wait? Uh, I don't think we should wait too long because uh, we don't want to keep people waiting. So, I, uh, and Laura, do we have him up on the screen? Is he there yet? Is, no. So I think we should maybe go to Austrina because we don't uh, we don't have them up and it, otherwise we have dead air here. So let's let's okay. perhaps I will continue. I would now like ask to Austrina Romanese to present her report on transition and development, the Black Sea region, economic and geopolitical tensions. Uh, please, our Austrina, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, greetings from Vilnius, uh, from my office here in the Parliament. I hope that everybody is uh, safe and healthy after these, uh, well, uh, unexpected uh, events uh, that uh, that are all over the world. Uh, so. My report is about Black Sea region, and uh, well, we are. Uh, we, we already received uh, quite a lot of uh, the amendments uh, by Georgian um, delegation, also uh, some other delegations, and I, I will be happy uh, to consider them, and, and uh, it will be very helpful to upgrade it. Uh, so the Black Sea region is alive with economic potential and imperiled by division, uh, rivalry, and conflict all with implications, the international system as a whole. Uh, the Black Sea itself should be understood as a strategic crossroads of Europe, Asia, and the Middle East. And not surprisingly, it uh, has also become the object of a great game in which uh, global and regional powers compete for influence, uh, wealth, uh, leverage, uh, navigation privileges, and access to resources and ports. Unfortunately, development of the Greater Black Sea region has been seriously hampered both by international and uh, civil conflicts and clashing interests that undermine regional uh, trade and investment. Uh, the draft report before you, uh, that uh, some of you already uh, maybe uh, read it, uh, uh, suggests that uh, Russia's ongoing conflict with Ukraine is now the defining dispute in the region. Uh, but there are other bilateral and regional tensions uh, that cannot be discounted, um, including Russia's occupation, of course, of two uh, Georgian regions. Uh, Russia has quite apparently determined uh, that it is, a, uh, it is better to have borderlands paralyzed by tension, civil war, uh, and frozen conflict that it is to border prosperous and confident states enjoying good neighbor no, good neighborly neighborly relations. Uh, uh, Western governments, uh, by contrast, typically seek stability and uh, welcome self-assured, democratic, and successful states on their own borders. Indeed, while Russia's worldview is infused with a zero-sum logic, uh, the Western community of nations uh, large, largely adheres uh, to a win-win liberal international outlook on international relations and trade. This is why our approach to the region is so different than uh, Russia's. 
It is a well-known axiom in economics that investors abhor risk. Uh, sadly, the Kremlin has very purposely pumped risk into the heart of the Black Sea region. Uh, the draft report notes uh, that Russian aggression has complicated economic uh, transition for those countries in the region, uh, working to integrate into the global and uh, European economic order. Uh, this report also details several uh, of the obvious and less apparent economic costs Ukraine has endured because of Russian aggression. It has not only lost jurisdiction over Crimea and seen the Donbass economy wrecked by fighting, but since the construction of the Russian bridge over the Kerch Strait, Ukraine's commercial ships are now hopelessly delayed uh, when passing through these international waters. This has imposed enormous costs uh, on the Ukrainian uh, Azov seaports, um, such as uh, Mariupol and uh, Berdyansk. Uh, the report points out that the uh, the countries of the broader Black Sea region collectively make up the second largest source of oil and natural gas in the world uh, after the Persian Gulf. The region is also a critical nexus for energy pipelines of great geopolitical importance. Uh, sorry, geopolitical importance. Uh, the report explores how these pipelines are shaping the region's security profile and describes uh, the struggle for regional influence that is underway. This is a topic that has long interested this committee and some of you may be uh, recall our, uh, our visit in Azerbaijan last year, for instance. Of course, uh, not all the news uh, is bad. There have been instances of successful regional cooperation, uh, for example, in matters pertaining to environmental stewardship. Here, both Black Sea economic cooperation and uh, the European Union have played important roles in fostering cooperation on very tangible matters uh, of shared interest in the region. Those countries seeking membership in NATO and the EU have an added incentive to participate in collective efforts to build um, deeper uh, regional cooperation, while those regional states which are already members have been an important uh, leadership uh, role to play in this regard. Uh, when this report was drafted, uh, uh, well, it was before the COVID-19 pandemic, and we uh, have added uh, uh, the whole new section about it, about how pandemic could affect uh, particular countries um, around uh, the Black Sea region. I won't go into the details a lot, so you uh, may check uh, the report and take a look at it. Um, this draft report concludes by calling on NATO member states to continue to insist upon respect for international law in the Black Sea region, including the principles of independence, sovereignty, and territorial integrity, as well as the respect of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, including freedom of navigation. It accordingly argues that NATO member governments and parliaments uh, should maintain the sanctions, um, uh, sanctions regime on Russia. And Russia's serious violation of international law should not be normalized. The effort to build flexible energy infrastructure in the region and throughout Europe uh, should continue to minimize uh, the capacity of any one power to cut off energy or use energy to exercise diplomatic suasion. Me, uh, coming from Lithuania, we know very well um, how countries um, may manipulate these energy resources, you know. Um, uh, 
Energy diversification strategies are also essential, uh, but region-wide cooperation efforts are also, um, also needed. Uh, the Black Sea Economic Cooperation Organization continues to uphold the principle of fostering dialogue and achieving agreements on matters of uh, shared concern among the countries of this region. Um, for instance, shipping, environmental stewardship and fisheries policies are areas where dialogue among all littoral states will continue to be needed and welcome. In in a perfect, perfect world, its cooperative agenda would be broadened, but in the current atmosphere, this is uh, very difficult to imagine. So I would finally add that it is important that allies maintain a united front in opposing Russian aggression in this region. This is not to say we should not cooperate uh, with Russia in the future, but, um, well, now it's, uh, it's very difficult. and. Uh, where Russia threatens European and transatlantic security and interests, we need to stand in strong opposition uh, to Russian imperialism. We have to remember that we have certain values, such as uh, freedom of speech, uh, well, liberal democracy, free elections, and of course, uh, we have to respect other country, countries' borders. So thank you very much, and I will look forward for your comments. Thank you, Aldrin, for your speech. Okay, um, who are on the list? Is it somebody, we have Paul? A, one, one request currently, sir, from uh, Az uh, Azerbaijan. We have Malahat Ibrahim Zi. In addition to that, okay. we have uh, the Deputy Secretary Please, General. Malahat. Please, Malahat, the floor is yours. Uh, dear Chair, Honourable Participants, first of all, I would like to greet all of you and it is a very pleasure to see you again. Thank you very much for creating the opportunity to share my opinions with you today. As a member of Black Sea Region, this report is important for Azerbaijan. I would like to give a brief overview of the energy security of region. As you know, Azerbaijan continues to make a positive contribution to energy security of Europe. However, recent Armenian military provocations on the Azerbaijan-Armenian border have once again demonstrated that the region is unstable and that a dangerous confrontation could break out at any moment. I would like to deliver our deeply concerns that the military provocation around Tovuz was only 15 kilometers away from energy and the transport infrastructures which plays significant role for the European energy demand, as well as NATO transit to and from Afghanistan. It is even more disappointing that Armenia has resorted to such provocation at a time when the whole world is struggling with COVID-19. Armenian Prime Minister Nikol Pashinyan spoke on Hakopian's recent visit to the occupied territories of Azerbaijan and taking part in military exercises with women also fuels the current conflict significantly. I call on, on the NATO Parliament Assembly to take serious measures to prevent further illegal activities in order to ensure the energy security and the stability of the Black Sea region. Taking this opportunity, I congratulate my colleagues from Turkey on the rich natural gas reserves they have discovered recently in the Black Sea. We hope that the discovered gas fields will make a positive contribution to Europe's energy security in the future. Dear colleagues, before concluding my speech, I would like to say a few words about, about the ongoing escalating tensions between Turkey and Greece. In this, in this regard, the official position of Azerbaijan has been clearly stated by Azerbaijan president. We believe that activities of Turkey in the eastern part of the Mediterranean within the, principle, within the principles of international law will serve security and the cooperation in the region as a whole. I would like to emphasize that the Azerbaijan society appreciates efforts of the NATO in reducing the growing tensions between two NATO member states. We are convinced that the undeniable mediating role of the NATO on 
this matter will bring peace and stability in East Mediterranean region. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Malahat, for your speech. Uh, two years ago, our committee also visited uh, Baku and to visit also your um, uh, British Petroleum firms, and to we were surprised as you just uh, signed the agreement uh, with seven countries to build a new uh, pipeline, what is going through the seven countries to the Italy. Very great project. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. For you your welcome yeah. again. Thank you very yeah, much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ethan, is it uh, some more questions? I saw the Jamori Bokel is here also. Jamori Bokel has logged back in. I think he may just want to test his microphone. Sorry, microphone in his uh, video. But uh, our Deputy uh, Secretary General Henrik Lidl has a question he would like to ask. Yes, hello, uh, hello, Ivan. Hello, uh, Afina. Hello. Very good to see you. Balahad, how are you? Hello. Um, yeah, a very, very good report, I, I have to say. I mean, I read it with great interest. So uh, I personally am a bit invested in, 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 uh, in sort of these uh, maritime uh, uh, issues because I, I come from a, from a region or from a city as well, which is one of the bigger ports on the, on the Baltic Sea, one of, uh, one of uh, your, your neighbors in, in Lübeck. And I, had, um, um, I wanted to focus maybe a little bit on the, on the positive. I mean, we talked a lot about, and you talked a lot about, uh, about the problems in the regions, and I, I cannot uh, but agree with all of those points. But can you maybe draw out some, some of the positive um, aspects, perhaps, um, in the region that we can build on? I mean, I was I was uh, I was sitting um, by the by the Baltic Sea this summer in Lübeck, and I saw those those ships coming in in and out from from Estonia, from Sweden, from uh, from Finland. Uh, just you know, every ten minutes there was a big tanker coming by. So, is there something we can build up uh, in the region on, the, on this front? Uh, is maybe one of the one of the areas that we could think about. I was just reading this morning that the World Tourism Organization is is hosting its annual session in Georgia. Is there some of those those uh, economic sectors that we can build up perhaps as a positive experience? Thank you. Austria. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you, David, for your uh, intervention. Uh, yeah, I totally agree with you. Uh, even though I think that um, it's a bit uh, difficult to compare. Uh, the Baltic Sea neighborhood and uh, uh, the Black Sea neighborhood. Uh, well, uh, we are quite lucky. Uh, no one, at least not yet, occupied any uh, of uh, uh, the countries surrounding the sea. Now, this Black uh, Sea region is, of course, much more complex because we have NATO uh, country, uh, Turkey. We also have uh, Romania, Bulgaria, but then... Uh, than Russia and Crimea, which is occupied by uh, by Russian forces. Um, but of course, I'm also a, I'm also a, a an optimist. <laughs> so I think that uh, this Black Sea economic cooperation cooperation framework is something we could base um, uh, base uh, the cooperation and increase it, especially in the, the those kind of sectors like fisheries or tourism and so on i mean those maybe someone would may call it soft uh, soft economy so of course um, we have to build uh, well at least uh, probably in the future countries will 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 have to cooperate not only in these uh, particular areas but further anyway but still uh, it's very hard to cooperate when you uh, when you have different values actually opposing values completely opposite. So uh, here around the Baltic Sea, uh, we have Nordic Baltic countries, of course we have Russia, but uh, mm, so hopefully the future will be brighter in the Black Sea region. I, I hope for it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Austrina. The Black Sea, it's not only uh, very good to uh, have economic position, location in the world, we're connected with many countries, but also around go and through the Baltic Sea, the Black Sea also going many pipelines in steel, still also built a new a new one. Uh, and become dangerous. It's very important also what will be happening with the ecosystem in Black Sea. 
the World Bank also prepared this uh, and to give the money for this ecosystem also because during these socialistic times also there was many minerals also put it in the water in the on the land and then they come into the water the water was not only clean now it's become better and better but still the problems there are and how are you looking to the we also need to fix uh, these systems uh, we are yeah. fixing now in our in our uh, report but maybe it should be more wide or still continue also to, yes, to well, fix this attention a green policies is also something um, countries uh, could cooperate more on, um, I mean, linking your question uh, to David's uh, question. Of course, and uh, of course it's a priority not only for, um, for instance, I don't know, uh, uh, European Union also uh, will invest heavily uh, to green policies, especially taking this uh, new uh, framework, European Green uh, Deal, um, so yes, uh, this is something uh, countries could also uh, cooperate and increase their cooperation uh, regarding the environment, uh, regarding pollution uh, of the sea. Uh, so yeah, thank you, Ivan, for your uh, comment. So thank you, Austrian. Uh, I think can I say <laughs> we have on the list uh, two person. That's right. And I yeah. give them to get the, the question, and then Austria will be a response. Uh, the first one, the, the chairman of the delegation, uh, Turkish delegation, Osman Askin Bak, and then Mevlut Karakaya, also from Turkish delegation. Hello, Osman, Hello. the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ivan. Uh, 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 greetings from Turkey, from Istanbul. Uh, I'm sitting by this uh, black sea, <laughs> so, so uh, thank you for the uh, report, uh, excellent report for, uh, by Austrian. Uh, we have put some uh, amendments and for some comments for the reports, we already sent them. Uh, black Sea region is very important uh, for, uh, for, uh, for Turkey and also for, uh, for NATO because uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, we are uh, facing with Russia in that uh, region. So economic issues are very important for the uh, region, and also uh, thanks to our Azerbaijan colleague uh, Melad Ibrahim Kasi for uh, his congratulations about uh, exploring uh, uh, gas uh, uh, in, in Black Sea. Turkey has found uh, three, uh, 320 billion uh, cubic meter uh, gas resource, and we are continuing to search. Uh, uh, petrol, uh, oil, and uh, gas in, in the region in our uh, exclusive economic zone. So uh, Turkey has uh, uh, have a ship, uh, a ship uh, on the on, on Black Sea, in, uh, 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 and also we have a, uh, uh, we are we are showing flag uh, of NATO uh, through Turkish flag in the region, and we are all uh, we are uh, we have. Uh, tell many times that uh, uh, illegal uh, occupation of uh, Crimea we cannot accept. We are uh, putting this in every international uh, aspect. So Black Sea is becoming more and more important uh, in terms of economy, and also uh, we are also we have a good, uh, very good relations with uh, our uh, NATO members, Bulgaria, Romania in terms of uh, uh, some other issues, and also with Georgia. Yeah, and also with Georgia, uh, uh, Turkey is playing a very critical role in Black Sea. And uh, uh, my question, and I would like to ask uh, one more comments and questions to Ersten. Uh, the issue is in NATO, in other NATO countries uh, uh, should uh, uh, show uh, fl flag uh, in, in the Black Sea also. We need. Uh, to see any other uh, support of uh, those Bulgarian, uh, Romanian in, uh, sh ships, I mean Navy, because we have to make uh, uh, work together. And in terms of economic issues, uh, there is, a, as you know, Brexit cooperation, uh, which is uh, headquartered is in Istanbul. So I do go uh, have some dialogue with them as, uh, in, as soon as, 
when I have time. So thank you for the report. And the, the, uh, my question is, uh, we, I mean, you mentioned about uh, uh, green uh, uh, environment in the Black Sea. We, uh, we have to discuss uh, some of uh, issue because Black Sea is getting dirtier and dirtier. So we have a problem uh, in, the, in the Black Sea in terms of uh, sh uh, fishing, in terms of some other uh, issues. So uh, I would like to hear his her comments about uh, the, uh, getting uh, uh, dirty. We don't want to see Black Sea uh, like that. So we have to work together on this issue also. Thank you. Thank you, Osun. Thank you very much, Osman, to be here. Austina will be asking the next question from, from uh, Mevlut Karakaya, and then you can to respond. Okay. Please, okay. Uh, Mevlut Karakaya, the floor is yours. Thank you. Ha hello to everybody. It is very nice to see you on the screen. I hope we will see each other again uh, soon. Uh, I would like to, uh, to give... Uh, a couple words on the issue. As Mr. Buck uh, said, uh, Black Sea has uh, little importance in economic, commercial, cultural, and environmental fields. Uh, cooperation in maritime issues, particularly in the fields of safety of navigation, maintenance of security, protection of merit, uh, marine environment and fisher could be further developed via homegrown uh, initiatives and mechanisms to be established with the participation of the littoral uh, countries. Turkey does not support the interference of non-littoral actors setting priorities, policies, regulations, and uh, or rules on maritime issues for the Black Sea. Uh, another cooperation effort for Black Sea Harmony have so far served as major security providers in the Black Sea maritime areas. Uh, Primarily, uh, the Montrex Convention forms as essential element in the context of security and the stability of the Black Sea as a wider region. Turkey has been transparently and uh, impartially implementing the Montrex Convention since it is signature 84 years ago. Uh, thank you for your uh, comprehensive presentation. Uh, uh, and uh, I don't have uh, any question. Uh, thank you uh, again. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mevlut. Austrina, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for your uh, speeches and comments. Um, of course, uh, we as NATO, uh, we consider uh, environmental issues, but it's not our main focus. I mean, and in this report, we also maybe could have stressed it more, but uh, security, stability is uh, is something we are focusing on. Uh, so, but uh, yeah, coming again from the Baltic uh, neighborhood, uh, I know very well, well, we have uh, the most polluted sea in the world, uh, the Baltic Sea. So I know very well these issues uh, regarding of how it is important for the neighboring countries uh, have a, you know, a better, a better quality um, of the environment and the uh, sea pollution. And of course, Black Sea is a uh, it's a domestic sea. It is surrounded heavily by by many countries. So obviously, it has it has similar challenges as we do here in the Baltic. So of course, we need to work and cooperate more on that. And maybe maybe this is something that 
that affects everybody equally, uh, be it Ukraine or, or Georgia or any other countries in the neighborhood, uh, Romania, Turkey, uh, it affects, these challenges affect, affect uh, everybody equally. So maybe this is something we could uh, work uh, uh, on more in the region but again this report doesn't uh, uh, does not go deep into these environmental issues it it, it just reflects uh, the political and uh, and um, uh, well situation geopolitical situation in the region so uh, thank you everybody for your comments and and uh, i'd like to thank uh, uh, the our secretariat and the team uh, for for making this report uh, possible. Thank you, Alcena. Eten, I don't see anyone on the list. So thank you very much for your report, Alcena. And I repeat uh, once again, please send the additional comments on either of these reports to our committee director, Paul Cook. Thank you very much, Osrina, for your excellent speech, excellent reports, and we'll be looking forward in attendance in November. Thank you very much. But we Mr. can Senator continue. Um, we, need, we need Senator yeah. Bokel to request yeah. the floor again. Monsieur le Senator, est-ce que vous pouvez quand même appuyer sur uh, request to speak? Et comme ça, on peut mettre sur uh, l'écran. Merci. Something happened. It. Keep keep silence. Certainly, there always are some <laughs> small technical challenges with these meetings. <laughs> he he was up and now he's he's off. So yeah. let let's wait a minute and see if he he can get back on. Um, so if everyone could be patient for a few minutes, we'll try to get uh, Senator Bokel up so he can present his report. Ah, voila. I think he's, he he's now up now. Yep. yep. He's here. Okay, excellent. Senator Bokel, the floor is yours. And Senator Bokel will present the draft report of the Subcommittee on Transatlantic Economic Relations, the Gulf Crisis, and Global Energy Market. Senator? The floor is yours, please. Yes, uh, I will speak in French. Uh, do you have the translation? Yes, we can. We can. And I have no... Because it's, uh, je, je veux m'excuser auprès des interprètes. First of all, I'd like to apologize to the interpreters, but we changed our, our system at the very last minute, so I don't have any headsets. I, I had some before. The interpreters do hear you, sir. Yes, we do hear you. So before reading my report, I'd like to apologize for the connectivity uh, trouble. I'd like to thank the chairman for his kind words. To me, it is indeed my last meeting. I have greatly appreciated the way he chaired the committee. And I'd like to share with you a little anecdote about that. A few years ago, him and I were competing for the general report of the committee. And I think that it was just one vote that made the difference. And back then, my colleague was 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 a gentleman. He never held it against me, and it was a pleasure for me to support his um, candidature as a chairman of the committee. And I think that this only um, reinforces willingness to be a great chairman of this committee. And uh, I hope you, you will forgive me, chairman, for, for telling this little anecdote. I see you laughing, so uh, I guess the translation is good. <laughs> and I had no doubt about that. <laughs> so first of all, let me recall that the report I will introduce to you was drafted in the spring. Of course, it will be updated. Uh, following this meeting and uh, by Athens, it will be one of my colleagues who will take over the job because I will have gone. Um, we will, of course, include deeper 
discussion of the changes on the global energy market that have intervened because of the uh, global pandemic and economic and health crisis that we're experiencing and which also have an influence on the Gulf uh, countries. The report recalls that the Arab, uh, the the Arab states of the Gulf have uh, for a long time been the focal point of the global energy system. Uh, before the appearing of the COVID-19 pandemic, the position of Gulf countries on the global market was already faced with a number of new challenges. First of all, the rapid development of a North American production of oil and gas. Uh, with a decrease in the cost of renewable energies and, of course, the concerns linked to climate change. As years went by, there were new uncertainties as well that came up before the crisis. The United States were about to become a net exporter of energy with, of course, uh, uh, all the geostrategic changes that it might have brought about even in the Gulf countries, but here again, things have radically changed as well. First of all, let's recall that before the crisis, the American producers uh, could enjoy increase in prices to increase their own production, and this increase in production would then lower prices, so they controlled the situation. Uh, the collapse of oil prices in March, their stabilization at about $40 a barrel, uh, which is lower than the profitability threshold for most of their non-conventional oil production, had a devastating impact on North American uh, producers. They're not competitive anymore. And of course, this decrease in American competitiveness has strengthened uh, the position of OPEC, the organization of uh, Arab nations that produce oil. Despite the fact that OPEC had also to agree with lower prices because of the collapse of the global demand, Gulf oil is, of course, now or will probably get a greater share of the American market in the months to come, and it will invert the current trend of decrease in American imports, and it will change, of course, the strategic implications that uh, the whole situation that existed before had. The perspective of United States with energy independence is now fading, and the influence of the United States on the global energy market has decreased. It is therefore unlikely that the United States will soon be able to influence prices on the energy market. The report also explores the evolution of the geostrategic landscape in the Gulf region. Uh, of course, the Arab Springs, the wars in Iraq and Yemen, in Syria, Tensions linked to the nuclear program of Iran, uh, the of course uh, the breaking of negotiations on the Iran deal, uh, interventions in countries like Syria, Iraq, Lebanon, Yemen by Iran, the intervention of Saudi Arabia and of the United Arab Emirates in Yemen, the rivalries between the Gulf countries with Qatar or between Qatar and the other Gulf nations demonstrate that the region is in crisis. The weaknesses of the energy sector of the Gulf have appeared in September 2019 when the Houthi rebels have attacked uh, main oil refineries in Abqaiq in Saudi Arabia and the oil field in Quraysh with missiles and drones. The Houthi rebels have claimed responsibility for these attacks, but many analysts and observers believe that Iran was behind the attacks. Those attacks demonstrated that relatively cheap, let's face it, and simple missiles and drones can have a very costly impact on the global energy market uh, because this led to uh, a very significant, even if it was only for 
a, a limited amount of time decrease in Saudi oil production. The crisis has also has a strong bearing on the United States and allies like France or the United Kingdom to try and strengthen regional stability. The decision of the United States to use their strategic reserves has contributed to calming the markets down and to minimize the risk of an, an economic, a, a global economic shock. The United States have also announced their intention to deploy more forces in the region upon the request of Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. The report also reviews the evolution of the relations of the United States and the European Union with the region of the Gulf. Um, be it transatlantic interest in maintaining the stability of the Gulf region or true disagreements on the nuclear deal with Iran. Divergences of views between Qatar and um, the uh, Gulf uh, cooperation uh, community has become an issue for the transatlantic link, including and also the war in Yemen. The report also deals with the cooperation of NATO with the Gulf countries within the framework of the ICI, the Istanbul Cooperation Initiative, and reviews the many ways of having a deep dialogue between NATO and the regional actors. As far as Russia is concerned, of course, its intervention in the Syrian civil war must be understood as Russia claiming to be a great actor in the region. The regional ambition of Russia cannot be separated from its energy interest. Russia is trying to stabilize international oil prices to its advantage, and some observers even say that it's trying to diversify its supplies of natural gas and also attract Gulf investment on Russian soil. The price war between Saudi Arabia and Russia started in March 2020 by Saudi Arabia in response to Russia's refusal to reduce its oil production to maintain prices at a decent price led to a sharp decrease of oil prices in the spring of 2020 and everybody was a victim of that including Russia. The decrease was further accelerated by the closing down of economies of course because of the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic. Both countries however finally managed to get an agreement. The fall in energy income has had negative effect on the whole Gulf region. The Saudi government, which is deep in, in reform of its economy, of its society, has had to increase the debt ceiling up from 30 to 50 percent of its GDP due both to the decrease in oil prices, but also the impact of the pandemic on Saudi soil, and they've reduced their expenditure by 5%. It's a, a country in crisis. China is trying to promote its interest in the Gulf without getting too much involved, at least for now, on matters of regional and uh, interior security. They, they do have a base in Djibouti, but it's a different continent. Um, it's increased, China's increased need in energy is, of course, at the heart of whatever China does. Uh, its initiative of the new Silk Road, for instance, would provide it with a new superstructure to promote its own commercial and strategic interest. Uh, China also has a rhetoric that hides all these interests. China is also trying to reduce risk of uh, uh, the flows of energy to its port region, port cities being decided by others. This concern is one of the catalysts of the rebirth of China's navy and the efforts of increasing China's maritime presence around the Straits of Ormuz and Bab al-Mandeb as well. Dear colleagues, the report we're re reviewing today, and by the way, I'd like to thank Paul Cook and his team uh, for that, is or includes, and yes, I, I need to welcome the great partnership I've had for five years in different incarnations as rapporteur with Paul Cook, with his team, and with the Secretariat of, and all the teams of the NATO Parliamentary Assembly. Thank you. So as I was saying, the report that we're reviewing today is uh, also, also provides 
provides an update of the recent changes brought about by COVID-19. The Gulf region should be um, put into the deepest crisis and recession ever um, because of the pandemic and a decrease in oil prices. It's not, of course, the only region in the world, and it's not the only problem. Uh, the countries of uh, the Gulf are now shaken by the pandemic, and, uh, of course, uh, let's face it, foreign uh, residents represent about 90% of the population of UAE, 66% of the population of Kuwait, 50% of the population of Oman uh, and Bahrain, 30% of the population in Saudi Arabia, the biggest country in terms of population. And therefore, well, people might have forced expatriation, might have forced return home. Migrants might be expelled from those Gulf countries, but also uh, these countries are missing specialized staff, healthcare personnel, and the countries are basically not equipped to face the sanitary crisis. Of course, tourism and travel towards these regions have been hit hard as well because of the pandemic. And uh, the budgets that, that funded ambitiously programs for the diversification of these economies uh, might actually be reduced, and Western companies also had vested interests in there. They had future investment prospects in the Gulf countries. All of that is going down, obviously. The COVID crisis also has geopolitical repercussions that are unexpected. UAE, Qatar, Kuwait, for instance, recently provided medical assistance to Iran. It's a good thing. It could be understood as a way to slowly change uh, what a lot of people interpreted as a move towards war. And but the tensions uh, uh, between Qatar and other Gulf countries remain. The report concludes that Europe and the United States must work hand in hand to decrease tension in the Gulf and to promote agreement within uh, the Gulf countries or amongst the Gulf countries and making sure that the rivalry between Iran and the Gulf countries does not start or trigger new conflicts. The US and Europe must within NATO be in tune. We must work hard with regional partners that are necessarily linked to NATO. I'm thinking Saudi Arabia, for instance, the report also suggests that in the long run, stability in the Gulf will demand for these societies to be more diversified in terms of economics, more open, more tolerant as well, and that the reforms in these nations should provide for a fair distribution of wealth, uh, of, of course, linked to that uh, greater freedom for women, greater emancipation, greater uh, fairness of society in general, um, because, you know, when econom economies in these countries uh, are, are hit hard, it's harder to reform them. Um, of course, I'm awaiting your comments and suggestions. I was a bit long, but it was my last one. Uh, but again, let me thank all my colleagues, the chairman of committees and subcommittees, and on the French side, let me also uh, thank uh, uh, Lise Le Ménager, who's a secretary here at the Senate, and who, Paul Cook knows it, uh, next to colleagues in the French Senate, has been following up uh, wonderfully on all of these topics. Uh, she's listening. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Excellent. I have uh, five people on the my list, and I think uh, we will ask the all to get there, and uh, Jean Marie will be response after the all question. Yes, hey, Ethan, I think we'll be doing this. Yeah, we will bring yeah. up uh, yeah. um, uh, 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 Jordan, uh, sorry, Mario Salamas from Greece. Mario first. Salamas. Yeah. Hello, I'd like to thank uh, Jean-Marie for an uh, excellent presentation. Because Greece is um, a country, member of NATO, which is close to this region, I would like to appoint uh, some uh, uh, thoughts. Uh, energy security is a collective uh, responsibility and an essential component of our national security. Uh, Greece uh, emerges uh, as a viable and um, credible transit country to Europe markets 
by adding more energy sources and routes and developing our indigenous energy resources. The main goal of uh, Greece's energy policy is to maximize energy security through multiple and alternative cost-efficient and competitive energy interconnections. In that vein, Greece cooperates in bilateral, trilateral, and uh, multilateral formats which country, with countries such as Cyprus, Israel, Egypt, Italy, Bulgaria, etc. In pursuing the goal uh, to maximize energy security, we are also active on a multilateral level in the European Union, the Energy Union, and the International Energy Agency. To this end, Greece is um, implementing projects like TAP and IGB, gas pipelines, etc., and actively promotes the realization of other energy infrastructure projects, such as uh, East Med Gas Pipeline, FSRU uh, in Alexandropolis, as well as institutions like in uh, the East uh, Mediterranean Gas Forum. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marius. Next one, Hendrik Blidal from NATO Parliament Assembly. Hendrik, the yes, floor sir, Okay. Well, I'll speak French, uh, Mr. Senator. It's a, it's a it's a great pleasure for me to see you here today, after initial technical difficulties. Uh, you will you will be missed at the Secretariat. Be aware of that. It was a great pleasure to work with you. Thank you very much for uh, the work that you've done for and with the Assembly. Now, after that, I would have two questions. First of all, I think that uh, we also yesterday's ceremony in Washington. What kind of consequences do you see uh, in the normalization, cooling down of links and contacts between the Emirates, Bahrain, uh, on the global energy market and in the Gulf area. Um, entre, entre. Between the commercial interests as well as the geopolitical interests. And what is the image of China in the region. Do you have any uh, impressions about that? Thank you. Congressman Rick Larson from the United States. Bring him up. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Uh, Jean-Marie, good to see you. I'll speak English. It's the only language I know. I apologize. <laughs> Uh, unfortunately, Henrik uh, took my question as the American on the call. I thought I would ask the uh, American question, but I do think it uh, would be valuable in your report to at least uh, to consider what the Bahrain, UAE, Israel deal might mean in this context of the report. There are a lot of other issues that are important in, for Middle East peace, and I'm not asking uh, you to look at those and consider those issues in the context of the report, but certainly... If, the, uh, if there's language in the security deals that have an impact on energy markets, maybe on, on cooling tensions that contribute to price increases, that contribute to instability, if there are some views that you can provide in the report, I think that would be a valuable addition. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you for your service as well to uh, the NATO Parliamentary Assembly. Jean-Marie, we all appreciate it. Thank you, Rick, for your question. Next one, Lord Chopling. I'm me with these machines. Um, Jean-Marie, I'm so sorry to hear you're going to leave the Senate. Uh, I have to say that there are great uh, some differences between my country and your country. Our big advantage is that if you're a member of the upper house in the UK, you're there for life and you don't have to go through elections. And uh, I'm sorry that you have to have that uh, little problem. 
uh, I must congratulate you on this report. I certainly learned a lot from it, and, and very grateful indeed. Uh, one of the other things I'd just like to raise, um, uh, first of all, a couple of things, well, three things, really, which I think you might consider including between now and the um, assembly annual meeting in uh, based in Athens. Uh, the first one I had I wanted to raise was exactly the point that Henrik and Rick Larson have raised, that I imagine that following the agreement between the Emirates and Bahrain with um, Israel uh, will uh, be um, included. You will ha I, I guess you will need to amend the report to take that in. Uh, just as a side to that, this is a process been going on quite a little time. I can remember raising in our parliament, uh, asking a question of uh, one of our foreign office ministers, uh, whether they were aware of a rumor, I think it was about a year ago, uh, that the Crown Prince um, um, had paid a, a very secret visit to Israel. Uh, this was um, a rumor, or, or it was said it was a very high official assumed to be the Crown Prince. And I think uh, if that, I haven't, I'm not sure whether that's ever been verified, but it would be quite interesting to put it in, uh, suggesting that Saudi might join the Emirates and Bahrain in, in the process. Uh, two other things which I Lord think Joplin, you might... I'm sorry to interrupt yes. you, sir. I'm very sorry. Yes, if you move your microphone a little bit up from your mouth, it will help us hear you more clearly because you're cutting off the sound a little bit. Thank you very much, sir. I'm sorry. Yes. Two other matters which I was quite surprised did not appear in the report. The first one was the overlaying tension which covers the Gulf area, uh, namely the tension between the Sunni and Shia communities. This is a major political confrontation. And I do, I, it may have been in somewhere and I missed it. Uh, but if it is not in, I do think a passing reference without getting into the arguments uh, might help the report. Uh, the other thing I did think you might think of including would be the possibility of hydrogen becoming a, a much more readily uh, available um, source of energy. Uh, you mentioned in the report um, solar and wind power and that, but I didn't see a mention of hydrogen, and I thought that might come in. Uh, now, the next point I wanted to raise is that there have been, uh, there was a reference, one of the earlier speakers, in fact, I think it was your introduction, you talked about diversification, which is covered very thoroughly in the report. Uh, but it did occur to me that the case of Dubai, which is mentioned briefly, where, of course, they have no hydrocarbons or virtually no hydrocarbons, uh, and they set out to become a center of finance and tourism in Dubai. And now, as the report uh, points out, the economy of Dubai is in very serious trouble. And I imagine they'll have to go again cap in hand to their neighbors in Abu Dhabi uh, to uh, be bailed out. Now, the final point I wanted to make was with regard to Russia. Uh, paragraph 66 in the report uh, very helpfully refers to break-even prices for the Gulf countries for oil ex extraction. Um, and, and that is extremely helpful. Uh, but in paragraph 62 and 60, and, and I do think that uh, uh, it might be helpful 
if you could try to put a figure in as to what a break-even point is for Russia, uh, because they are obviously a major player. And I did, I had a figure in the back of my mind that is that the Russian economy depends on a price of uh, Brent crude at around 70 or 80 dollars a barrel. And if you could have put something in about Russia's break-even point, I would be grateful. And my final point is, I did, I was a bit puzzled because paragraph 43, you talk about Russia's priority, the second one being the uh, undermining of Europe's efforts to diversify its natural gas supplies. Yet, in paragraph 46, just three paragraphs further on, you say Russia has no interest in Europe diversifying its energy supplies. Whether that word no has crept in by mistake, I don't know. But it does seem there is a contradiction there. And maybe uh, you could just have a look at that and see if I'm I'm... Uh, right. I could well be wrong, but I did see a contradiction between paragraphs 46 and 43. Thank you so much. I'm sorry I've been a bit long-winded. Thank you very much, Lord Jumpling. I have uh, one more name on the list uh, from United States, Neil Dunn. Please, Neil, the floor is you. Very good. You can hear me. Yes. Yeah. Yes, All right. So uh, uh, thank you very much. I want to thank the senator for his uh, great service and, and also for this report. Um, I, I do want to, one brief comment. I, I, I saw at the front end there was some concern that America might be withdrawing from the, uh, the Persian Gulf area. I assure you we have you know, enduring commitments and interest in, in, in our relationships with our allies there and also uh, a presence there as well. Uh, so, but to the report, uh, as we looked at the topic of energy security in the Persian Gulf, I think we have to realize that these nations are actively building multiple, multiple gigawatt size nuclear power plants with more on the way. So two up and running in the UAE, two more UAE, some in Saudi and other places. I think this very much is a part of the energy security in that region. One of the question that NATO must look at is, Will those nuclear power plants be designed and built by NATO members or allies or by China and Russia? And I want to emphasize, we don't, we don't get a vote on whether or not they're going to build the nuclear power plants. That's happened. That ship has sailed. Um, but we can collaborate with the Gulf nations in designing and building and, uh, and, and helping with their fuel cycles as well. Since 2000, 22 countries have engaged in uh, project construction projects of 150 nuclear plants. 97 of those are Russian or Chinese. Um, nuclear technology is essential to our collective national security. Uh, preeminence in that technology is also essential to our security. And I'd like to see us address in the report somehow the importance of the nuclear power development in the Gulf region and what NATO's role in that might be. And with that, I yield back. Thank you very much, Neil. Jean-Marie, the floor is yours. Please, response. Oui, je... Thank you very much, Chair. These are extremely interesting questions. For the past three years, uh, I have been working on Gulf country issues. I'm chairing our group within the French Senate. Can everybody hear? Yes, we can hear you, sir. So uh, before Turning to uh, the questions with uh, a particular nod to my British colleague. Yes, I could have stayed in the Senate and NPA. I could have stood for election again. It's a question that I did uh, ponder. 
But I felt that after 40 years in political life uh, as an MP, senator, minister, locally elected official, that maybe it was time to move on to the next step in my life. So I would like to uh, reply to our Greek colleague saying that I understand the importance uh, of these issues. In the Mediterranean region, these are very topical issues. In particular, as regards explorations of new uh, uh, sources of energy. And of course, NATO can play an important role in a dialogue between the various parties in order to ensure that no country in the region would uh, be uh, harmed. We have the Greek islands uh, right next to Turkey the territorial waters, the economic zone around Turkey, of course, and sometimes we can see uh, the line is difficult to determine. This is not something recent. It is a far from simple issue. We can say that objectively. And I believe it is our duty to ensure that as regards these issues, uh, when it comes to uh, seeking out new sources of energy, uh, to look for dialogue, negotiation, to seek out compromise uh, in a very complicated territorial area. And I think that NATO can play a role in this peaceful approach. Turning now to the various points that were brought up from the various colleagues, uh, the points that they would like to add. I fully agree. I fully agree that we can recall or perhaps to emphasize China's influence in the region. So the colleague asked for my personal opinion. I believe that in any case, we are going to have to become accustomed to having to deal with the Chinese presence in the region and not simply in the China Sea. Here again, I believe that the Gulf countries, as is the case for other uh, countries in the neighboring African continent, for example, We'll need to try and determine when we have China that seemed to be a savior, that seemed to be an, perhaps uh, a new ally, the possibility of being able to insert some competition uh, coming from China versus the traditional allies. And now they're seeing that things are not that simple. Now, of course, China is an energy and trade partner. However, it's important to be attentive to not ending up too much in the hands of China. So I think that the Gulf countries have understood this as others have the importance of diversifying their partnerships. As regards the United States, I never wanted to say, I, I hope that this was understood, that energy issues uh, that the United States are grappling with uh, uh, versus the point in time when their own uh, resources gave a bit more weight in the markets, but not saying that, of course, America is not interested in the region and that the role that the U.S. played with this uh, agreement between Israel and various Gulf countries, as many countries have uh, mentioned, it's showing how important they are and showing perhaps the weakness of Europe as regards the issues involving Israel, Palestine, and peace in uh, the region. That's an interpretation of the European countries, European countries members of NATO. Meanwhile, I'm one of those who are commending the commitment of the United States in this approach, an approach that is one of fostering stability, peace in uh, the Gulf region. We know furthermore that there already are uh, partnerships that have been there for some time. This is becoming official. It's far from neutral. It's changing the balance of power, the political uh, balance. And I would state that even if we look at this from the energy standpoint in this report, we would need to have a strong reference to this agreement. The British colleague brought up 
the position of Saudi Arabia. Here we have a, a very political issue. Everyone knows that this is a, a country where things are shifting right now above and beyond certain scandals that uh, we've heard about, but things are shifting in terms of its society, its modernization. But everyone has known for a long time that there are ties, in particular in the area of uh, security, between uh, Saudi Arabia, Israel, and of course the United States. But everybody knows as well, how can I put this, that the Saudis also know just how far it's possible to go in particular during these times of economic crisis, and that certain gestures that might be public could be misinterpreted by the population, by public opinion in these uh, countries. And this is why perhaps there's this caution. But Saudi Arabia is a dominant country in the region. If it were hostile to the agreement, we know today that uh, the agreement would not have taken place. It's something that we're all aware of. Next, there was uh, an allusion made to the Shia-Sunni divide. I understand your position. Of course, this is a long-standing issue. I'm one of the people who never has wanted to explain the tensions there might be, not only in the Gulf, but also in the Muslim world, generally speaking, through the Shia-Sunni distinction. Not so long ago, there was a time when the Shia and Sunni in the same country were able to live together intelligently. So this is not the foremost issue. It is one that's become politicized. And I think it is not up to us to do this. It's on the contrary. Perhaps we could gradually be able to pull apart from this distinction, even though I'm not naive when I say this. We know what's happening in Bahrain, for example, but we shouldn't uh, perhaps uh, add to this uh, divide between the Shia and Sunni. The British colleague also stated that when we spoke about diversification of energy sources, which is an important challenge throughout the world in our countries as well as in the Gulf countries, we cannot, of course, forget even though for the time being it's emerging. Of course, the use of hydrogen as a fuel, I fully agree with this. And in the same vein, the American colleague, Neil, yes, of course, we do need to speak about nuclear power, especially since we have had this first nuclear power station in uh, UAE. We do know that they are some of the richest countries in the Gulf, uh, that they have begun this diversification for some time. And in France also, some people believe that nuclear power, it's almost 70% of the energy in France. And so we're trying to bring that down to 50% so that we can rebalance our energy mix, in particular as regards renewable energies. But some believe that uh, nuclear power will continue in our societies, our countries, or the world to play an important role and that that is a positive thing as regards the climate challenge. It is uh, largely carbon-free energy, so we shouldn't demonize it. Uh, and there are strategic reasons, as you also stated, and we know that in this report we will perhaps be emphasizing it more. So I consider that all of your comments were helpful, constructive, and should be taken into account. Uh, and I'd like to tell Paul Cook that over the next two weeks coming that I will be working quite hard before uh, turning over to my colleague. So we have the responsibility uh, of ensuring that these amendments uh, that have come in as very helpful dialogue uh, will be included. So we'll be doing this uh, under the very competent authority of our committee. Thank you, Jean Maria, for your response. And uh, you will be always invited to the NATO Parliament Assemblée. Is it any questions? Uh, I don't have any on the list. No I, I, yeah, no more questions. I can say thank you, Jean Maria. Thank you very much, you all. Yeah. Uh, thank you. It was a pleasure for me. Uh. But uh, I can re repeat also in, uh, any, any uh, additional comment or raise of this report. You can to send to the our Economic and Security Committee Director Paul Cook. Please send to. Send to. Okay. Thank you, Jean Maria, for your report. This was excellent.
but we will continue our agenda. Next one is, uh, is there any business? No? Okay. Date and place of next meeting, dear colleagues. We do have a request for the floor, sir, actually, uh, from okay. Michal Serb, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, Sherba, Serb. Michal Sherba from Poland. Any other Hello. business, Michal? Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome and thank you for great uh, reports that were presented uh, uh, before. Um, I'm just thinking uh, as a chairman of uh, Transition and Development uh, Subcommittee about the current situation in Belarus. I think um, maybe it will be a good idea to discuss whether our subcommittee could uh, prepare in the future uh, the report on the situation in Belarus, um, taking into consideration, of course, economic uh, and social challenges uh, which are happening uh, right now. Um, I don't remember I, my question to, to you, Ivans, but also to our uh, NATO PA um, staff uh, uh, team, uh, whether we had this kind of report on Belarus uh, and uh, what would be your comment on this idea? Uh, as, I, as many of us uh, participated in the, in the event on uh, on, on, on Monday, uh, which was excellent discussion and a very fruitful uh, and very, uh, uh, very, very interesting. I know that it's a problem with uh, preparing a kind of resolution on Belarus, on situation in Belarus, because of some political reasons. Uh, but um, I think it's a good idea to use this tool of report of, uh, of our economic uh, uh, committee and also this, this sub, the of subcommittee on transition and development will be uh, quite useful and be uh, quite challenging to us. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, um, Oshrine would also like to take yeah. the floor. Please, yeah, sir. Oshrine, the floor is yours. Um, well, thank you, uh, Michal, uh, for uh, for the idea, actually, I was thinking something similar, and I think this is a good uh, this is a good uh, floor probably to stress out a bit uh, more about what's going on in Belarus. And I know that uh, we had w webinar. I'm sorry I couldn't attend uh, um, attended because we're having elections in four uh, weeks. Anyway, uh, so uh, just. Uh, 30 kilometers from uh, the NATO border, uh, cruel regime basically beats people. And it's not only, uh, you know, human rights violations. Now, I think there are much more. It's in the middle of Europe. It's uh, neighboring European countries, but the regime acts uh, as if uh, they were from Nazi Germany or Stalin's, uh, as Stalin's uh, communism. So I think that we uh, NATO countries should uh, impose sanctions. And what I'm hearing, for instance, uh, from the European Union side, that uh, there are only 17 people uh, that will be included in the, into the sanction list. And I think that is not enough softly speaking, because there are hundreds of people that are organizing fraud elections, that are organizing aggression against their own people. Uh, all the opposition is in jail or had to leave the country. Uh, they basically were taken out of the country uh, against their will. So, we have to isolate uh, Lukashenko. Uh, he's not a president of Belarus anymore. And I know that many people are skeptical about the, what's going on in Belarus, about future of democracy in Belarus. But it's fifth week after the elections, and every weekend there are more than 100,000 uh, people uh, on the streets of Belarus. And not only Minsk, but also other other cities, and not only city center of Minsk, but also district of it. Uh, so I think it's quite uh, quite impressive, and we need 
as a organization, as a as countries of value, we need to we need to we need to isolate the regime and sanctions. I mean, I'm a believer in soft power, and I think sanctions could be uh, could be a, an effect, effective thing. So, uh, us as NATO PA, we also have to put not only in our official document, but back in our parliaments as well, uh, impose individual sanctions individually, uh, each country. And uh, those sanctions have to be have to be uh, more ambitious. It's not ten, it's not ten people that organize these things. It's hundreds of people. Hundreds of people. They shouldn't come here to our free Europe and spend their money uh, that they uh, made in with their bloody hands. Sorry for being maybe emotional, but we are close to it, and uh, and we see what's happened. What is happening there? Sorry. Yeah. Thank you, Austrina. Uh, thank you, Michael. It's a very good idea because the situation become more hot and more hot. In the house said the Mr. Vichorka, the lecturer of the uh, this uh, our, our, our website web, web, webinar in Monday, just uh, the deadline will be 9 of October when the will be inauguration of the Lukashenko as the president. And perhaps in that day or before that day will be much more people on the street. But Paul, I think we can to prepare some some plan for next year. Who will be working uh, and these topics also we can to include it in our report for next year. Thank you very much, uh, yeah. Paul. Yes, Paul. No, yeah. no, I was just going to say I was going to say we have our you know two leading officers of the subcommittee here. So I, I think uh, it seems to me this is the direction we sh we ought to move. And so for the planning for next year, we'll mm -hmm. put uh, we'll yeah. put this down as the topic for uh, for investigation and also for the visit for the visits. We'll try to work this theme into our work next year. But thanks for the input. That's very helpful for me as we plan for next year. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. But we will continue date and place of next meeting. Uh, dear colleagues, the secretary will be in touch with more information as soon as possible concerning the date and venue of our next meeting. I look forward to seeing you there. And closing remarks. This concludes the meeting of the Economic and Security Committee. I would like to thank all members for their constructive and uh, fruitful participation during our proceeding today. On behalf of the entire committee, I would like to express our great thanks to our interpreters who have done a magnificent job in allowing us to communicate so effectively. Many thanks to the committee director Paul Cook, coordinator Anne Laura Bleus, who have worked so diligently to make this meeting possible, and to all NATO Parliament Assembly staff involved in the running of this meeting. Thanks as well to Lucas Kisilius, our research from, from Lithuania, who is taking notes today. Finally, Thanks to all our members for taking time out of their busy schedules to participate in this important discussion and to our reporters who have worked so hard on these two reports. I now adjourn this meeting of the Economics and Security Committee. Thank you for excellent job. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.